Oh, Lord God Almighty, we just thank you for this awesome day that you've blessed us with, Lord. You know, the opportunity just to come before you and praise you and thank you. Yes, and Lord. just fellowship with, with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ that have a desire to live for you, Lord, and to yes. get to know you deeper every day, Lord. So, uh, Lord, we celebrate this Father's Day for humans, Lord, but we should really be thanking you every day for being yes. our Heavenly Father and, and just loving us, you know, unconditionally, Lord. And we're so thankful for that. Just yes. uh, bless Pastor Harley today, Lord, as he continues to teach us your truth, Lord. Just open up our spiritual understanding to receive it, Lord, so that we can go and share it with the lost and dying world, Lord. We thank you for all your provisions yes. that you faithfully provide for the opportunity for us to share the, your goodness and your faithfulness and all that uh, you do for us, Lord. We're so grateful. We praise you and worship you and give you all the glory today in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And welcome again for those who are watching on either Ustream, TV, or YouTube. Privileged to have you back with us. This morning... In Revelation 16, we're actually going to uh, go to verse 9 and actually stop at verse 9. I would highly suggest, recommend that you, uh, all of you would, uh, that didn't get a chance to see the video earlier today, uh, that you would get that video and watch it. Because if I go back to do review, I'm not going to really get far in our study tonight. I want to try to get as far as I can before the body finally wears out. I'm tired. <laughs> so, no in advance, I'm tired. I'm really, really, really tired. I'm going to try to give it as much as I can. And uh, primarily, in short, I still recommend you uh, watch the message that was preached earlier today. In verse 9, there's a very important point that uh, I began to focus on. That's the lighter portion. And they repented not to give him, him being God, glory. And we had said earlier uh, that this isn't the first time that this was seen. Um, these uh, different kinds of plagues and judgments from God were done previously in, in previous chapters and uh, they expressed the same kind of of uh, failure to repent um, in chapter 14 um, in the, uh, the they should I say they failed to glorify God um, as well as repent because you'd have to do that first as we'll see um, they failed to glorify God acknowledging that God was responsible for um, the uh, the judgment that they were experiencing and the net result of the judgment was to cause them to glorify God, to actually acknowledge that He is God to glorify Him and to recognize that all the judgments that had come already and were yet to come were from Him and that they were to worship Him as He created. In other words, frankly, to get saved. That's the whole gist of it right there. As we'll see, even in our study uh, this afternoon. And one of the points I kept bringing out today was the fact that even in the midst of all these horrible plans, I mean horrible, horrible judgments, that God still gave men space to repent. I find that amazing that God still, in the midst of all these horrible plagues, still gave people opportunity to repent and give Him glory. We saw it in chapter 9. Uh, we saw it in, uh, in other chapters as well. When the angels came and they began to preach the everlasting gospel, um, that was an opportunity for people to repent and glorify God. But that whole issue at the end of, of verse 9 of chapter 16 really captured my uh, attention. So I want to really just take some time to think about that today. God gave or created mankind, I should say, to give him glory. And the only reason why mankind fails to give God glory is because they simply choose their sins over him. They will not glorify him. They choose their sins over him. And, you know, we could easily prove that over and over again by any 
uh, study of the scriptures. And the, the reason, the only reason why this point is so important is that it is within the nature of a man to be unthankful to God and refuse to glorify Him. Creation, the evidence of God is, surrounds us all the time. Uh, the evidence of God is in creation. The evidence of God is known even on our own conscience. So we're not going to get away with that. That's there's there's no place in our in our life where we get away from a conscious knowledge of the fact that there is a God. And the reason why is because God said so. The biggest dope in the world is the atheist. I mean, I hate to be blunt about it because I mean I can't think of a position more foolish. And and I have there's a young lady who is I love her. She's she's she shows great wisdom. I just wish that wisdom would result in salvation. And I think one of the reasons why she sees the foolishness of the church, and it's a great turnoff. And I get it. But with respect, I think a position of atheism is nonsense. And I'll explain why uh, later um, as we study this. You, if you saw my friends list, you'd be amazed at the people who actually follow and listen. But they're following and they're listening. And that's that's where I want them to be. Because hopefully they'll understand that one day um, their views and their thinking is wrong. They would want to repent and follow the Lord. I want to give them an option other than watch a bunch of knuckleheads professing to be Christians. You know, focus your attention on what the Word of God says, what the Lord says, and live for Him. And not don't live for the views of others who profess, whether they're real or imagined. It's in the nature of man to be unthankful to God, not to glorify God at all. And one of the classic examples, of course, of this failure to glorify God is right back in Romans 1. But before we do that, and we are going back there, uh, because some things I saw in Romans 1, you know, I've studied it, I've, t I've taught it, I've written the commentary about it, I've gone back to it numerous times in materials, and just this morning, it's just another... Epiphany, another, another switch went on about something that's related to Revelation, related to where we're going in the book of Daniel. and It's just all connected together. And it talks about the fact that man simply will not glorify God because he chooses his sin and more specifically idolatry over God. So they won't do it. It's not that God has not made himself known. Obviously he has. They just suppress the knowledge of that reality and they just go hog wild into sin. And so the point was again, as it was last time, man deserves judgment because of that. He refuses to submit to, to be thankful to God because of who he is, and to glorify God because of who he is. He or she opts, therefore, to go into their sinfulness. We want to, before we go back into Romans, uh, examine some other passages of Scripture to witness to us the same characteristics of the wicked to do exactly what is seen in Revelation and Romans and other passages as well. That is, the failure to glorify God and to worship idols and their other sinfulnesses. We don't really see, because we're not God, how being unthankful and not glorifying God is to God. So we can't really understand it because, well, we're not God. So we don't have really the understanding he has. And how he looks upon that. It is not a good thing to be unthankful. And if you look at your society, the one of the characteristics I see all the time and hear all the time, or most of the time, is ingratitude. People that have so much stuff, and yet they're just ungrateful for what they have. It just, no matter what they have, no matter what they obtain, no matter what, they're just never thankful. They're never grateful, they're never rejoicing, they're just always embittered, and you look at their life, and it's just one big giant suck into self and sinfulness, they just don't get it, they can't find the fulfillment in themselves, because there's none there, but they still try, but deep down inside, there is a suppression of the fact that they have long since rejected God, and won't glorify God, and that's true of all of mankind, before they become to uh, the place where they come to know the Lord. Let's turn back to Daniel chapter 5. Oftentimes people run to Daniel for prophecy, but there's some great lessons that we can learn other than about eschatology in the book of Daniel. 
Now, the backdrop of this, of course, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He couldn't find anyone to interpret his dreams that were troubling him. He called all of his magicians and soothsayers, what have you. They couldn't answer any of the dreams. They couldn't interpret the dreams. And they were willing to do it if they would, if, if the king would give them a clue as to what the dream was. He said, no, I, I shouldn't tell you what the dream is. You should be able to tell me what it is. Anyway, there is a rumor that Daniel was able to interpret dreams. And so King Nebuchadnezzar calls Daniel says, I, I have this dream of troubling in my head. I want you to tell me what the interpretation of the dream is. And I'll give you such, such, such. Verse 17, Daniel 5, And Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make it known to him the interpretation. Excuse me, that was not Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel 5, that's Belteshazzar. Better be. Yep, Belshazzar. O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him whom he would slew and whom he would keep alive and whom he would set up, and whom he would he put down. In other words, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had tremendous power. And all this was given by God. God was literally using Nebuchadnezzar to do all these things. God gave him this ability. I'm not saying he had a relationship with God. I'm just saying that God gave him the ability to do these things. It's amazing. If he wanted to set up this, he would do it. If he wanted to bring it down, he would. If he wanted to defeat you, you were done. Tremendous power. But when his heart, verse 20, was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, keep that in mind, he was disposed from his kingly throne and he took his glory from him. Now, if you look at the text in Daniel, which we will uh, in Daniel 4, not yet, but in Daniel 4, you read what happened. And oftentimes you go, wait a minute, it didn't say in Daniel 4 that his heart was hardened in pride, but it was in Daniel 5. It explains what happened, what really was going on. His, his mind hardened in pride. <clears throat> he began to admire his kingdom and his power and his glory and his this and his that. And God said, I think it's time for you to recognize who really gave you these things, who gave you this power, and whose kingdom <coughs> really belongs to whom. I'm going to tell you that it belongs to me. I'm just basically doing with you what I will. And so we had a meeting. We're driven from the sons of men and eating food like, like hay, like the cows. But his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne, and they took him, took his glory from him, and he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was like, was with the wild asses, they fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. God rules in the kingdoms of men. God, I've said this so many times, it's, it's a difficult truth for us, and, and I'm throwing me into us to grasp. Every single leader in the world, God has that man or men there to do his will, whether we know it or not. You say, well, how in the world, why is America being beat down? Well, go back to some of the million times I said that God would use uh, use a leader in our country uh, to either exalt us or debase us based on how we treat the Lord. And we could say God bless America all we want. That doesn't mean he's doing it. You don't get God to do something because you're a cliche. America is absolutely a wicked and detestable nation. And clearly God is judging us and we're too proud to even see that. We're suffering from the sin of Nebuchadnezzar. We don't even see it. We're boasting about our kingdom and our forces and our troops and our, our this and our way of life and our demo and, and the whole thing is being pulled from under us and we don't even see it. It's collapsing right from under us and we don't even see it. 
in all aspects, financially, politically, morally, ethically, socially, the whole infrastructure is being pulled from under us, and we don't even see it's collapsing upon itself. But we don't really see the, the, the ultimate reason why these things are happening is because America is a godless nation. And the more we attempt to ignore God and act as if we don't need him and blaspheme him and persecute his people, the more God's going to amp up the wrath. It's going to happen. It's going to keep happening. I mean, people getting all hyperflex about, you know, the, the killing of nine people in the church. And yeah, it's a horrible crime. It's a terrible crime. It's a terrible thing to happen. I'm going to tell you the reason why they're making a big fuss about it. You're not going to like what I have to say, but I'm going to tell you anyway. A lot of all the media coverage is because the person who was killed, the pastor, who was, uh, a, who was, was a legislator? He was some kind of government. It's ironic how it's okay if you're a Democrat to be in the church, but if you're a Republican in the church, they want to throw a church and separation of church and state at you. But that's, that's, I digress. But the fact was that he was a liberal and a Democrat. And how they like to play it their own. Now, when others who were there, are plenty of people who've been shot and beat up and stabbed, what have you, in many different churches throughout the last ten years. But as long as they were conservatives, no one even cared. But if they're Democrats and staunch Democrats, and you know, the, some of the things that he was preaching was really pushing a liberal agenda. Oh, we want to talk about that and, and how this is some kind of a horrible. And the boy they're killing here is a psychological problem. When a black boy kills someone, he's a thug and a crook. When a white boy kills someone, he's got a psychological problem. They're saying that forever. That's always the template. See, white people can't be thugs. You know, we're, we're the, all y'all got mental problems, which I think is even more insulting than being a thug in the hood. You know, I mean, what a way. What a, the, the fools, I want to start a race war. That's what he just said. I, I don't have to you know, figure out what his mind is. He just told me what was in his mind. He did it because he was mad. He wanted to just amp up a bunch of, a bunch of racism. What, what's to talk about? And every pundit's talking about it. And it's all the talk shows. And they keep playing the same thing 8,000 times. And I just t- keep it. This has been where the TV is pretty much. Am I watching Abbott Costello or some old TV, some Columbo or something? Because it's the only thing I can watch is not polluted by all the junk. But the, the greater crime is we, we are so hyperflexed upon the, the, the horrible death of nine people, but the 50 to 100 million babies we aborted since Roe v. Wade, we don't even care about that. You, you don't think that's odd? We care, oh, it's so terrible that, you know, that these people and children, I care so much about children, yet you pass policies that murder children, don't even bat an eye about it. It's okay for you to murder babies, but you don't think about that. Well, let me tell you something. If we don't think about it, God thinks about it. He doesn't like that. People don't think God gets angry with that. The blood of millions of children on the hands of this country. And we think God is going to bless this? You are some serious stupid. And now the amping up of the persecution of saints and this clown in in the White House doesn't do anything to help to protect us at all? I mean, even the things that he said... Instead of saying this is a horrible crime against professing the professing believers, and I'm seeing an increase in uh, criminal behavior towards the church of Jesus Christ. No, he says it's about gun control. It's all political. It's got nothing to do with the fact that Christians were killed any more than ISIS. ISIS slaughters, uh, murders Christians, and the White House says, well, the reason why they're doing it is because they don't have any jobs. Did, yeah, that, my initial response was, it's a good thing I don't drink anymore, you know, because this, this is insane. They don't have jobs, so they slit Christians' throats. Uh, no, they don't like Christians, so they cr- uh, slit Christians' throats. That's why they're slicing the heads off of believers, because they don't like believers. And they're telling you this, that this White House is a joke. We're telling you why we're killing believers, and you're trying to say it's because we don't have job core in, in our countries. We already have money, fool. <laughs> what do you think we do with pirating all those ships and getting all those ransoms that we get from people, you know, to send their sons and daughters back so we can get them later and behead them? We have money. We, we, we take control of whatever we want. That's got nothing to do with the money or a job. I got a job. I kill people. I mean, it may not be an executive job, but it's a job and it pays good. 
so we, we don't even care about life. We don't care about the life of believers at all. And we think God is not moved by that? Really? Wow. I mean, apart from a few platitudes and a couple of tears, most believers aren't moved by it. They don't even care about that. A little bit outraged. I was looking at a clip early today where ISIS is setting up all over in, in the Middle East, in the Philippines, in Africa. And their vow is to kill Christians. That's it. Their vow, they are specifically on this earth to kill Christians. And we don't think that God is displeased with that? And, and even more displeased with our lack of response? Dropping a few 500 pound, 1000 pound bombs on nothing? We think that God's not pleased. Oh, we took out Hama 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 and he's the... Who cares? Do you take them all out? He's the leader. I think they got a lot more leaders than the one you allegedly kill, which we have no way of verifying in any way. I think he just said to cause us to try to pacify us, but we don't, we don't care about the murder of others. Because if it, if it doesn't fit the political template and agenda, we can't use it. So we don't care. But we don't think that God really uh, is moved by that. God has leaders in positions of office to do his bidding. And if America needs a good old-fashioned spanking, guess what he's going to do? He's going to put people in place to ad administer the switch. And we're going to get that spanking. And we've been getting it for a while. But we don't recognize because of our own pride. Verse 22, And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. You, you were a first-hand eyewitness of the things I just mentioned about your father. You knew about all of this. But you wouldn't humble yourself. You wouldn't humble your heart. Even though you knew every... I mean, the testimony of your father was a big enough witness for you to know what to do, but you didn't even do it. You wouldn't humble your heart. You did the same thing your father did, and that was your, your heart got harder with your own pride. But hast lifted up thyself, verse 23, against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. You didn't glorify God. So the question that came to my mind was, and I think a question that we all need to be asking and to answer, is what did Daniel mean by Belshazzar not glorifying God? That's the first question that came to my mind. What do you mean by that? Glorify him as we do in the church or the believer? No, 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 different. Different. Think about it. Because the answer is clear in that he had his own father's witness and testimony as an example. So, let's go back to Daniel 4. We can see exactly what it means. Look at verse 8. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told a dream, saying, O Belshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and that no secret troubleth thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of mine head and my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. And the tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven and the sight thereof to the ends of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair or beautiful, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the bows thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. Good prosperity. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher 
and an holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, scatter his fruit, let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts and the grass of the earth. You seeing a picture here? Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times or seven years pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over in the basis of men. So God can take a kingdom, set it up, and put the worst person in charge. Hmm. 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 Just saying. Hmm. Hmm. I'll read that last portion again. In fact, I'll read the verse again. Hmm. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that, that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whosoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men, the, the lowest of men. Hmm. This dream, and, and that could be a, depending upon his interpretation, could be a good thing or could be a bad thing. It could, it could very well just refer to the fact that, you know, kingdoms of the world are ruled by God, but they are ruled, humanly speaking, by just man by just the man, or it could be that and the kind of man we're talking about is a low-down, dirty, rotten scoundrel of a man. Just saying. Verse 18, This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished or astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. He was really, really troubled by this. Astonished. Astonished would be astonished for a complete hour. The king spake and said, Belshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. Hmm. The tree thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight of thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is you, O king, that are grown, Become strong, for thy greatness is grown, and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas uh, the king saw a watcher, and a holy one coming down from heaven, and saying, Hew the tree down, and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with the band of iron and brass, and the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over, this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king, that they shall strive thee from men, or shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whosoever he will. Whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee after that thou shalt have known the heavens do rule. Remember that. I want us all to remember that. Whatever's going on down here, the heavens are ruling. The, the Lord is, is doing it. It's all affecting his plan. Oh, but I, you know, I'm not, I, shh, what are you, you going to do about it? What 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 can you do about it? vote whoever you want? Listen, 
We got how many? How many Republican candidates? We got forty nine now. Every 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 everyone with the who thinks they could win. It's Donald Trump, the biggest joke in the world. He was like, I like him. Trump is a fool. There's no way Donald. You know what? I'd have think the guy that got there now would, would win, so I better be quiet. <laughs> you know, I better go back to the scripture and go, God give it to whomsoever he will. And if he wants the wig master to be there, he's going to be there. Okay, so let me take that back. Listen, uh, one thing I'm, I've learned or still learning, the guy we got there now, no one expects him to be there. God put him there to beat America because America needs a good old-fashioned behind thrashing because of her view towards God. God is not pleased with America. You say what you want. Say what you want. This country's going down quick. Very fast. It's amazing how one man, use of God to chase the nation, could reverse years of prosperity so fast. Or actually set emotions, saying they were already in motion anyway. He just sped up the process. Verse 27, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Wow. It may be a lengthening of your tranquility or a lengthening of your kingdom. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he walked into the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom of a kingdom by the might of my power and for the uh oh honor or glory? Of my majesty. That was glory that was supposed to be given to God. He took the glory to himself. Make a note of that. Give God glory. Take none for yourself. And while the word was in the king's mouth. Verse 31. There fell a voice from heaven saying. O king Nebuchadnezzar. To thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men. And thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. He didn't take heed to the prophecy. He didn't take heed to the interpretation of the dream. He wanted the interpretation so bad, well, he forgot to follow the instruction, which was, Break off thy sins, sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. It may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. You know, a year later, I guess you forgot. Or just neglected it. Then started thinking he was responsible for everything. That same hour, verse 33, was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. Fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men, did eat grass as oxen, his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. Wow. And at the end of the days, I never can as lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. That's good. And my understanding returned unto me. That's really good. He lifted up his eyes to heaven, and then he got it. What did he get? Well, the first thing is he he blessed the Most High. The word blessed means glorify. He glorified the Most High. And I praise and glorified or honored him that liveth forever. He found it out by looking up to the heavens. The heavens reveal the what? Glory of God. The glory of God in the earth showeth forth his Daddy. Yeah. He looked at the heavens and he recognized the heavens reveal the glory of God. <laughs> you know how few people even think about that? They never put Bible together. The heavens declare the glory of God. Nebuchadnezzar looked up, and what happened to him? My understanding returned unto me. 
And I bless the Most High, and I praise and honor the glorified Him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom is from generation to generation. All that came to him by just looking to the heavens. Most people look up and just see clouds, or the sun, or the smog, or the fog, or the gloom, or whatever. They never see the Lord. They look up and they see the stars they don't even think about. They see planets. They see the magnificence of a God's handiwork that just screams, Can you hear me? Do you hear me now? I remember in Korea, you know, I grew up in New York and I've seen stars. I've seen meteors. I've seen eclipse, full and partial, sun and moon. Over in Korea, when you're out in the field and there's no light for a million miles, you look up at the sky and you see stars. You see a whole lot of stars that you never can see in the city. When it's pitch black around you, stars light up the night. It was so dark that the stars actually gave us enough light to see where we were going. And I would just lay on the hood of the truck and just look and just see. This is before I got saved. I couldn't, there was like innumerable amount of stars. And I was just in awe of all this, meteors all over the place. And little did I know all this would impact me years later all these evidences all these witnesses testimonies of the, of the glory of God would impact me later as I get older I see more and more of how all this was put together he looked up and he could be held the glory of God made, his understanding came back to him returned to him and the first thing he did with his understanding came back to him was he blessed the Lord he honored God and he saw the everlasting kingdom of God just by looking up at the sky, looking at the heavens. That's exactly what Paul said in Romans 1. Exactly what he said. Incredible. And all the inhabitants, verse 35, all the inhabitants of the earth, including himself, are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay or prevent his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? He does what he wants to do. And no one can stop him. No one can even hinder him. Oh, we hinder God. You can't hinder God. What do you mean hinder God? What if, where do we get this nonsense from? We hinder ourselves. We don't hinder him. Or if you do this, you're going to hinder the plan of God. God's plan is eternal. The only plan you're hindering is your own. Wow. He doth or doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. God is doing everything he wants to do right now with every life. I'm awake now. <laughs> God does what he wants to do. And who, who could stop him? Who can prevent him? Who could dissuade him? Nobody. Listen, it's already done. We're the ones living in space-time continuum. He's eternal. It's done. At the same time, verse 36, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. You know what's so amazing about this? God took him back and restored him to the same glory, the same strength, the same power, the same kingdom he had. And all he had to do was recognize and submit to God. God can take a humble man or a great man, doesn't matter, as long as that person knows how to be humble before God and recognize who he is, God can use him. He can make one great, make one abased or humble, doesn't matter to God. It all matters on how, how both that individual focuses his or her attention upon the Lord. They're great people who use the God. I could say they're great people, but biblically speaking, they're, they're nothing. We're just servants. You know, that's it. We're nothing. 
And I hear all this lauding and adulation upon people, and they get going to throw up because none of that's biblical. That's that. Listen, that's anti-biblical. Oh, that's such a great speaker. Oh, that's such a great. I've said it. I'm thinking, you know, really, when you when you and I, you know, uh, adhere great to people, are we really great? Isn't God great? We're not great. Only the. You know, we need to give God glory because if we're used at all, it's because of him, not in spite of him. You know, we don't have any inherent anything. That would go for anybody. Politics, church, whatever. We only, we only appear great because of the great God that uses us, but we're not great. There's nothing in me or anybody else that's great. Nothing in ourselves, nothing that we have inherited or, or inherited our nature, nothing. Wow. Now, verse 20, uh, 37, rather, I never can answer praise and extol and honor. The word honor is the word glorify. The King of heaven, all whose works are truth, in his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Amazing. So clearly we see all of the elements of glorifying God and what happened when it was refused by Nebuchadnezzar and his son was a first-hand eyewitness, according to chapter 5, verse 22, to the following. His father's glory, his father's pride, his father's refusal to give God glory, his father's self-glorification, then you have divine debasement, God took him way down, then after a period of seven years, you have repentance, glorifying God again. He gets divine understanding, and he gets divine restoration. This is a tremendous witness on the part of Nebuchadnezzar. On the part of Nebuchadnezzar. Tremendous witness. Tremendous witness. And yet, his son saw it all. Knew it all. First hand eyewitness to the testimony of all of it, which made him accountable for it and before God, yet he rejected and worshipped idols, brought his wives and others to blaspheme God instead of glorifying God. Okay, back to Daniel 5. I'm not sure we're getting anywhere near Romans tonight. Verse 17. And Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king. And this is this is the where he sees the writing on the wall. People use that expression. Well, the writing on the wall is blah, blah. The writing on the wall doesn't mean that something is going to happen unless you change. The writing on the wall means it's over. Okay. That, that person saw the writing on the wall. If that person saw it, he knew, she knew it was done. It's not, you see the writing on the wall, that's a warning. No, it was no, the writing on the wall wasn't a warning. The writing on the wall was a declaration that the, your day is done. It's done tonight. <laughs> no matter what you're doing, it's over. You can't run, you can't hide. Let the gifts be to thyself and give thy reward to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to the interpretation. Know thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory. In honor, and for the and for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, languages tremble and fear before him, whom he would he slew and whom he would he kept alive and whom he would he set up and whom he would he would put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne, and they took him or took his glory from him. He was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast. His dwelling was with the wild asses; they fed him with grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men and uh, that he appointed it over uh, whosoever he will. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, uh, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but has lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house, God's house, before thee. Thou and thy lords and thy wives, thy concubines, have drunk wine in them. That was praise the gods of silver and gold, brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not nor hear not, uh, which hear not nor know, 
And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, has thou not glorified. That's an amazing statement. So he not only failed to follow one of the greatest witnesses of the testimony of God's power, but he failed in that he actually did worse than his father, in that he took the hallowed vessels and mingled them with the idols and wicked idolatry and debauchery. He failed to glorify God. He just failed to glorify God. Glorifying God is not a small thing. It's not a small matter. It is a huge matter before God. Being unthankful, being an unthankful person, in particular to God, is not a small thing. It is a very huge thing before God. But we pass off these things just having an attitude. God doesn't do that. This is serious stuff. He failed to glorify God in whose life his breath was. <laughs> he, he just died. No, he, his breath was taken away by God. That's what happens to people. Oh, they just died. No, God took that breath away. We breathe because of God. In Him we live and what? Move and have our being. We, we, we live. James told us about that. If the Lord will, we shall live, live and do this or that. He, he wants us to understand it. Bible wants us to understand it. Listen, our breath is in the hands of God. Everything is in, everything about us. He said, in whose ways? In all your ways. You haven't glorified. You can glorify God. Wow. And they were told in all our ways to acknowledge Him. Amazing. He'll direct our paths. My goodness. He failed to glorify God in whose life His breath was, and His end would not be restorative but fatal. You hear people say, well, so and so's got time. Really? How do you know that? We keep hearing that. Nobody. I said, don't ever tell anybody that because you don't know that. You have no, you don't, you're not in control of life to make that judgment. You don't know that. You don't even know it for you. How can you know it for somebody else? His end would not be restorative, but fatal. See, God judged him greater because he had a testimony, he had greater knowledge. His father did the act, but he witnessed it. He should have learned from that. He did worse than his father. He took the hallowed things from God's house, and he unhallowed them. And God said, oh, well, let me write you a little love note. Let me text you right quick, okay? I'm going to send you an instant message. The first instant message was, was, the jig is up tonight, ye die. Perhaps today is a good day to die, because you were going to die. His end would not be restored but fatal, not in seven years, but that night. That judgment came like that. He would not humble himself before God and glorify God as his father did, which also sheds light on the elements of glorifying God, means to humble yourself under his absolute authority and to acknowledge and worship him as his father did. That's what I'm talking about, glorifying God. That's when the lights came on. I, I got it now. That's what it means in Romans. It means to humble yourself under the absolute authority of God and worship Him. That's the whole gist of what God says in Romans when He talks about the heavens declaring His glory, that all men see the Godhead. You look at me, you see creation, and if you have the right mind to see it and you haven't reprobated it, you see it for what it really is, you will glorify the Creator. That's why when Paul made some very specific things in Romans 1, which we're going to look at next time. We can't do it now. This is what heaven reveals. It reveals this, and this, and this, and this, and this. Even Church goes, no, and no. was wasn't taught that seminary. I don't believe that. Don't believe. That can't be. Well, that's what he says. That's, that's what he says. I'm not going to thwart what God says. I'm, I'm not going to say what, deny what God says. If God says that 
man knows him in their conscience, they know God, though, he does. I did before I became a believer, sure did. We all did. Especially wanted to do so listen, there were things in your life, I'm just gonna just declare that it was. I know it's true of mine, and I know it's true of yours. Let me finish this thought first though. I know I lose this thought. The elements of glorifying God it means to humble yourself under his absolute authority and to acknowledge and worship him as his father did, never can answer. So in Romans one, in many of the passages, this glorifying of God is mentioned it was a demonstration by a redeemed life through Nebuchadnezzar. If you look at Nebuchadnezzar's life, glorifying God was demonstrated by a redeemed life. He understood God. He submitted to God. He glorified God. He worshipped God. Therefore, salvation is the ultimate work of glorifying God. That's the whole point of Romans 1, in a nutshell. The whole point. The whole point is that man will glorify God, but he won't do it. He won't do it. And yet, it says clearly, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. I'm just reading. For the invisible, listen to this, listen to what creation reveals, and I'm done. This is, this is that, this is that, that uh, cliffhanger. Listen to what God said through the apostle, not through your pastor or your favorite Bible buddy. This is what God says creation reveals about him. This is amazing. And then we'll get to the reason why we don't see it. For the invisible things, that's Romans one twenty. In case you want to know, for the invisible things of Him, from the creation of the world, are clearly seen. Listen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are. What's the next two words if you're watching? Without excuse. No one's going to have an excuse before God and say, I didn't know you, God. Oh, yes, you did. I was, my, my testimony surrounded you every day. Remember we talked about in whose breath thy hand is? Every breath that you take is because of the Creator. Why is it that people don't see that, though? We'll see that next time. It's so simple. It just, it's, it, I got it. Sometimes it takes a while to get it. Or to get it more deeper. But it makes more sense now. Sometimes it takes a while. Some, that's why I said the Bible is a lifelong study. It's lifelong. Because it, you're always being changed by it. Your, your understanding of it is, is growing all the time. That's why it's impossible to be a believer. I, I've said this. God says it. <laughs> you don't believe me. I don't care. Believe what he says though. It's impossible to be a believer and not be ever growing in grace. You, you can't. How is that even possible? You, ha you claim to have the Spirit of God, which gives you an understanding of all things spiritual. God supplies all that we need to live the godly life, live the Christian life in a godly way. Provides every single spiritual blessing from the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Back to the Holy Spirit who fills and dwells, opens up our understanding to the truth. And we not know the scripture. Somebody's lying and it ain't God. So guess who guess who leaves? Guess who that leaves left? Ton of big old juicy whoppers. As we get older and mature and grow in the Lord, we see our our eyes get more and more open to these wonderful truths. And we just, it just, oh, it makes sense. I got it now. I got it. I'm getting it. I'm getting it more and more. Everything about God is seen in creation. Don't let nobody tell you. And, and once you understand that, this is how you should respond. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. We just saw that in Daniel 4 and 5. That's we understand who God is, just like Nebuchadnezzar did. I looked to the heavens, and my understanding came to me, and I got it. I 
got it now. And Paul's saying, <laughs> thousands of years later, the same exact thing. That every person walking on this earth sees the same thing. What they do with that knowledge is significant. All right. Well, I tell you, sometimes the, the study of the word, just as wonderful as it always is, it gets more wonderfuler and wonderfuler. And we're not finished with Daniel 5. We will finish next time. But it just it gets better and better. So Daniel's more than prophecy. Not knocking prophecy. That's why we should probably read the whole deal too, because there's a lot more in it than just, just prophecy. It's a wonderful book on glorifying God. Lord, thank you for thank you for you. Thank you for the truth. And I just pray that we would glorify you continually, Lord, to be thankful unto you, to bless your name, because you are good. And your mercy is everlasting, your truth endures unto all generations. You should be thanked all the time. You command men everywhere to repent. You command every man everywhere to glorify you over and over and over again, all through the Bible. Hundreds of hundreds of times you command even the heathen to give you glory because you deserve it. Many times we're commanded to humble ourselves in your sight because of who you are, and we should. May these truths ring clear in our hearts and minds, Lord, and, and may you just continue to show us your will. We thank you in Jesus' name. Next time we pick up at this point. Oh man, good stuff. And uh, thank you for watching again. And uh, may God bless you. Spread the word. And thank you for those who are writing me and letting me know that you are spreading the word about this, this humble work here. About this verse-by-verse -verse teaching through the Bible. And, and my prayer is that as you watch and you're blessed that you believe others can be blessed by it. Thank you so much for letting people know uh, that's a blessing. And, th and this, of course, will be rebroadcast on air uh, through Ustream and on YouTube uh, through our web pages on Facebook. So again, thank you so much for uh, spending the time with us today. May God richly bless you throughout the week. Lord willing, the same time, same channel, next time, 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Have a blessed week. Bye-bye.